It was a simple yet visionary dream to capture the magnificence of Africa as if through the eyes of a soaring eagle and to share this new perspective with the world. You fly over this continent and you see these amazing designs that nature has produced and these bold kind of pieces of art almost. Highly acclaimed German photographer Michael Pelitzer realized this dream We met up with him at his home in Cape Town to get the lowdown. When approached by wealthy businessman Stefan Breer with his idea for a Trans-Africa adventure, Michael quite literally jumped on board. I have a helicopter. I, I have that idea. I want to take my helicopter from my home in Switzerland and take it to my game farm in, in, in South Africa. Do you think that's possible? And if, if yes, are you keen to come? And I said, well, let me think about it. Um, no, actually, obviously, I was, I was very chuffed by that. To photograph Africa from a helicopter, it was an opportunity Michael couldn't resist. In September 2006, after three years of planning, Michael, Stefan and their pilots from Milan took to the air. Their eight-week adventure would take them from Hamburg, Germany to Cape Town, South Africa on one of the most extreme photo safaris ever. Having the chance to fly and visually see at low level you know how Europe changes then how you reach the continent in Egypt and into Sudan and then Ethiopia and Malawi Zambia Botswana all the way up to the northwestern coast of Namibia again on the Golan border and then all the way down to Cape Town it was just an, an incredible experience just to have that opportunity to see that all covering 19 countries eyes over Africa is Michael's latest visual treat hot on the shelf it's just been chosen for the publisher's choice and recently Germany Stern magazine published 35 pages of Michael's stunning images a limited collector's edition going for around 14,000 Rand is also causing a stir. Only if you can build up an emotional attachment to a thing, a, a person, a, a country or a continent, you start feeling responsible. But Michael has been criticized for showing only the beautiful side of Africa, leaving out the poverty and violence. Shooting over 25,000 images, he says he used the opportunity to change these perspectives. If you realize that something is still beautiful, then you're willing to protect it and you're willing to, to say, it's well, it's not too late, maybe, maybe we can still do something, you know? Eyes Over Africa showcases more than 200 pages of Earth's art. Normal darkroom routines were done on computer, but nothing has been changed or added. He says only one image has been cropped. Look at this. This is a beautiful lake in the northern part of um, Tanzania. Spectacular. This is spectacular. And in this mountain in the background is called El Donio Lengai, and it's the holy mountain of the Maasai. And this is also home of many, many flamingos. And um, if we go a little bit closer into the mountain, it almost looks like it's computer generated, yes, doesn't that's, it? that's exactly what I was but thinking. But it's, it's, yeah. Not doctored at all. No, no, no. But the biggest highlight for Michael was the beauty of Ethiopia. Landing on the rim of an active volcano near the Danakil Depression, their chopper was possibly the first to touch down there since the volcano began erupting in the late 60s. Tell me about sleeping next to or on a volcano under the stars. You know, it was an incredible experience. We were flying east towards the Danakil Depression, and it's one of the hottest places in Africa. And suddenly you see a bit of steam coming up there, and you fly closer and closer, and, and it's like, you know, you're over a lake, but it's not a lake uh, with water. It's a lake with, with boiling lava. And um, we managed to land on, on, on the rim nearby, and we had some camels bringing in provisions because you can't drive there. It's impossible to get there by car. We hiked down to the very, very rim of the crater and it was just an unbelievable experience. And as the sun was setting, it was starting to glow more and more. And all night long we had this, this orange glow over the sky and we were sleeping under the stars and it was just an incredible experience. Earlier in Cairo, they teamed up with Namibia's Ferreira, who would pilot the support aircraft, a Cessna caravan customized with a 600-litre backup tank and about 160 kilos of camera and safety gear. We had a harness on and we were linked into the harness, so we were kind of really, really tied to the helicopter, which was good because now, you know, you had a feel you could lean out of the helicopter, take some pictures, change the angle a little bit, work a little bit with that. You're clearly not afraid of heights. Um, if I don't think about it too much, I'm all right. Every morning at first light, the quest was on for the perfect shot with Michael hanging out over a void. Timing was crucial as images came and went in fleeting moments. 
I am actually impatient with pilots and 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 all of that stuff because I ah, go 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 you know because it's obviously um, you know matter of seconds. And pilot Roberto had to keep his wits about him as Michael bombarded him with instructions, often requesting nerve-wracking maneuvers in a chopper loaded to the hilt. Obviously, safety is the one number one priority, but I will always try to get as much out of it as he will let me. You know what I mean? Michael's not shy to push the limits. His first photographic book on Africa was a runaway success, and the New York Times wrote, it might change the way you think about photography. Playing with extreme close-ups and avant-garde angles, he consciously avoided predictable wildlife imagery. I can be quite an impatient person when it comes to people, but I think in, um, in nature and with animal, I very much learned my lesson. There's no money in the world and no pushing in the world that can make those animals do what I want them to do. So. I might as well just sit there and wait for it to happen. But waiting for it to happen is not really Michael's style. In less than a year after Africa's publication, he was documenting this rugged continent from the sky. We try to stay high enough not to disturb people. They have seen us and you see the occasional person looking up, but it wasn't like we were interfering too much. He says luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Trusting his digital camera, he usually shoots on autofocus. I concentrate on what I want to photograph and not how I must set my camera. And that gives me, I think, maybe that other half a second that I need to, to be fast enough. A GPS positioning every image and depending on the framing, landscapes acquired different personalities. We're looking at, at a beach and a tidal area, water coming in and out, wind and waves. And look at these creations here by nature. Let's have a closer look into that and what it would look if, I, if we go a bit closer. Can you imagine these patterns? Oh. I mean, it just, it, it looks like a painting. Or here, river mouth, water coming out, again, wind and waves working against it, and then creating these patterns here and on closer inspection. It looks like feathers. Yeah, bird feathers. Another of his favorites is this shot of life and death. A tree incinerated by a bushfire printed itself with its own ash. It spoke to Michael's constant self-reinvention. Growing up in Germany, he became a highly successful teenage actor, but left for America after leaving school to work for IBM. Bitten by the computer bug, he returned to Germany and went on to become the biggest Apple distributor in Europe, making his first million dollars by age 26. I made money with 26 and I lost a lot of money when I was 27 because I put it in the stock market. In 1983, everything was going down the drain. But instead of giving up, he followed his heart. He sold his business and began exploring the planet, filming and photographing his experiences. He had no idea that one day this would be his profession. I'm driven by enjoyment. That's also how I got into involved with my photography. I just did it because I enjoyed it. Investing in an underwater video camera, he piggybacked on filmmakers' shoots. I just started to film and when I came back, it turned out the footage wasn't too bad. So I was actually able to do like a 23-minute uh, film on and a little documentary on the, on the whale sharks. At 37, Michael sold another business and wanted to buy a boat to film underwater. But again, he was relying on his investment in stocks to keep him afloat. But the stock wasn't doing very well and my boat was getting shorter about a foot every day. But he managed to bring sponsors on board and continued to sail the globe for three years, visiting 53 countries and creating environmental awareness along the way. His book on the voyage also became an international bestseller, and in the end, the sale of his boat attracted the stars. I believe you sold it to Gene Hackman. He was one of the people that actually followed the journey as well, um, amongst others, and then he, he took over Starship because, you know, I, I actually couldn't afford it any longer, to tell you the truth. On his latest adventure in the air, money was not an issue, but nervous officials on the way to Africa were. West of Corfu, they made a loop over the Aegean Sea. Greek authorities radioed to ask what was happening. They grounded us on the next airport and wanted to confiscate all the equipment, wanted to take away all the cameras. I ended up bargaining and I gave him a memory card for the camera, but not before I did make a copy of, of the contents. This was the kind of misadventure they'd expected in Africa, but the biggest headache there turned out to be fuel supply. Flying over a remote Maasai village in Kenya, the support plane and the Augusta were running on empty. Lucky that I had some friends in um, Kenya. I told him, listen, this is where we are. And he said, oh, you bastards, you, you're um, quite a bit uh, in luck because I've got a few drums stashed in the bushes all over the country. 
We landed and we looked for the bush. It took us, I think, 30 minutes, but we ended up finding that, finding that drum of fuel that was hide, hidden in the bush. And we opened up, we fueled about 150 liters, and then we were, were lucky to go to where we needed to go. At the end of October last year, after two months of hovering above Africa, Michael and his team touched down in the mother city. With his feet barely on the ground, Michael is planning his next expedition to Antarctica. Set to leave this December, he hopes to once again encapsulate images of exquisite beauty and through his unique vision to increase awareness of global warming. We are quite far in the process of destruction, but it, we must never have the feeling it's too late.